Good morning. I call to order the meeting of the Saline County Board of Commissioners on this election day, November 3rd, 2020. Will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Shadwick? Here. Commissioner Sparks? Here. Commissioner Vidrickson? Here. Commissioner Weiss? Here. Commissioner White? Here. I ask you please stand, join me in a fly salute, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the uh, citizens' input portion of our meeting where city, uh, citizens may speak on county government, usually limited to three minutes, pertaining to items that are not on today's agenda. Anyone wish to speak? Seeing none, I'll bring it back uh, for approval of the consent agenda. And today's consent agenda is approval of tax roll adjustments, <coughs> approval of counts payable and payroll, approval of public forum agenda. Are there any commissioners who wish to uh, amend or withdraw anything from the uh, agenda? Seeing none, hearing no objection, the consent agenda will stand as approved. Uh, we'll move to action items. Item number one. Resolution 20-2297, review of section six, mask mandate. Jason Tiller, health department director. Good morning, Jason. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, as soon as the projector decides to wake. Uh, there we go. Maybe it's just the user. <laughs> All right, so here it is. It's election day. Um, and let's start with our national overview. Um, I do have to say that I think that this has been the highest uh, two week um, nationally case increase uh, of both cases and I believe uh, deaths since we've been doing this. Um, as you can see, in the last two weeks, over a million new cases um, and 11,000 new deaths nationally. In Kansas, we've had over 16,000 new cases in the last two weeks, um, an additional 175 deaths, but also additional 40,000 negative tests. So testing has been uh, ramping up quite a bit. Um, in Saline County, as of yesterday, uh, we had 1,225 cases total since the beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that 160 active uh, from reporting period to reporting period has stayed uh, relatively within that kind of range, 150, 170, um, with some fluctuation. Uh, we have had quite a few recoveries as well um, that ends up offsetting some of that number. Uh, but it is still a significant workload. Uh, average daily census at the hospital for COVID patients, I think, is set around five. Now, these next couple, um, the one thing I want to point out for the month of October is that we started the month with 784 cases and ended with 1,185. So we had 400 new cases in the month of October. And then just starting into the month of November, yesterday we had our single highest day uh, rate of cases. Uh, when we did uh, turn to the numbers to do the press release yesterday, we were at, I think it was 41 cases for yesterday. And then we had an additional um, 11 cases that came in after we had submitted those numbers. So we ended up with 52 total cases yesterday. Um, you know, 52 in the grand scheme of things may not sound like a lot, but a couple things I want to uh, touch on that kind of puts that in some perspective too. So investigations can take anywhere from an hour up to half a day or more, just depending upon the complexity of the investigation, um, uh, contacts, et cetera. Um, those contacts can range anywhere, potentially from two household contacts to um, maybe 200 at a funeral or a wedding. Um, and all of this is right now still being done by 11 staff, which includes our temporary staff, um, and we are still trying to add others. Uh, and that 11 staff is working pretty much six days a week um, with Sundays that we're trying to leave 
clear to you know just have a chance to rest and recharge but at this rate uh, it just may not be possible uh, these case kind of numbers continue um, all of this though we have a lot of people that we talk to that are understanding um, you know they get that they have to isolate they have to quarantine etc but we also have a lot of people that staff take a lot of abuse just plain and simple um, get cursed out um, end up being the brunt of people's frustrations over the virus whether they see it as something that's real or not uh, or if it's had an impact and then staff get that impact um, they've been verbally abused uh, verbally or borderline threatened um, so it takes its toll on staff uh, doing these cases day in and day out uh, and dealing with the quarantining the contacts as well Uh, at the same time, Kansas has submitted their COVID-19 vaccination plan to the CDC uh, on October 16th. And so now we have to start planning uh, for when a COVID vaccine is available. Um, their plan calls for a three-phase approach. Uh, phase one is limited doses are available. Uh, phase two, uh, more widespread doses are available. Um, and then phase three um, is just continuous shift into vaccination. Uh, the link there is for where the plan is at on KDHE's website. Of course, actual dates for a vaccine are still not known. There are many that are in trials and I'll show you a resource for that in a minute. Um, and what's going to complicate this is that depending on when it shows up, um, Many of these will likely be at least a minimum of a two dose uh, um, regimen initially. So we'll not only have the initial push of getting people vaccinated, then there'll be the, the second round. And if there's multiple vaccines, then it'll be ensuring that, you know, if you get uh, uh, vaccine type A to start with, that you get type A as the second one, because more than likely, like many other vaccinations, they won't be interchangeable for these first and second doses. So there's gonna be a lot of labor intensive effort uh, that's going to have to go into um, the vaccination campaign um, whenever it actually does kick off, which I don't expect till really after, you know, very early, late winter, early spring potentially. Now, as far as in production, the COVID-19 vaccine tracker, this is an online website. Um, that anybody can look at and it tells you at this point how many vaccines are, are being developed uh, what countries how many are in trials um, and as of right now there are 11 vaccines in phase three trials again no there's no timeline on when there's going to be a final approval on any of those um, and then of course you know it's just a lot of logistics about the distribution of those once we get them um, and getting those uh, out to people um, and I expect that we're going to see a lot of, of hesitancy. Um, a lot of people are probably going to want to wait until uh, this may have been around for a while. So it's going to take um, a long-term approach to uh, trying to get the vaccine out there. Uh, we spoke a while back about the Kansas Unified Testing Strategy. And although the full document still hasn't been released, the governor did make some comments last week uh, released a few graphics again the, the link is there um, right now we have mostly in this community have been heavily into the diagnostic which is dealing with symptomatic and outbreak testing um, screening has uh, begun and places like long-term care facilities in the last month or so um, where they're doing routine screening of their staff and or residents um, and we are not anywhere near this surveillance and they haven't really got it into yet what um, types of surveillance testing that uh, this, this testing statewide strategy is going to cover. Um, the goal of the statewide strategy is to double the amount of testing in Kansas by year's end. Um, and so that probably naturally leads into where can you get tested 
And so right now, these are the places that we're tracking at. We, we still talk about, you know, staffing it with your primary care provider because there are lots of things that can mimic the symptoms of COVID. So you want to make sure that if it's, if the, the primary care thinks that it's COVID, that you get tested, that if it's not, um, that you're getting treated for the appropriate um, uh, condition or whatever it is. Uh, but you can go to Salina Regional, Salina Family, uh, Myra Clinic is doing it, uh, Med Express has been doing quite a bit, CVS Pharmacy is doing uh, a drive-through um, uh, testing as well. And results from these different places, about how long we get them or are notified of them can vary. It just depends on the lab, the lab capacity, the kind of test it is, um, and how soon those reports are, uh, are, are sent to us. Um, so you can still get tested today, um, and it may take a couple days, depending on where you go and the type of test they do, to, before you get those results, and then we get them and can start investigating them. But let me reiterate, during that time period that, uh, that you're being tested, that um, you're supposed to isolate at home uh, after you've been tested. You're not supposed to go back to work. You're not supposed to go to the grocery store. You're not supposed to do anything like that. You're supposed to go home until you get your results. Usually primary care, when they get those results, um, will call and at least let them know what the results are um, and that if it's positive, that we will be in contact with them. Uh, there are a handful of times that when we contact people to start the investigation, that unfortunately that's their first notification um, of, their t of their result. <clears throat> so if you're big in social media, um, this is one way to get involved, uh, and it's uh, hashtag mask up Kansas. And you can uh, take a picture about why you wear your mask and, and post it to your social media and use that hashtag and um, see what other reasons people are, are wearing their mask. Lastly, I know the last several times this slide has been the, chain, has been the same, but if you'll notice that under the mask order, you know, this mask order only really works if everybody does their part. Wearing the mask, wearing it correctly. Um, you know, if we, if we can be more successful at trying to uh, have everybody wearing the mask, then the premise is, is that that will help keep transmission down and we don't have to do anything else. Um, I hesitate to, to even really talk about other restrictions or measures because of difficulties in enforcement, um, you know, a lot of the other the issues that that creates. But I think if we can all individually be responsible and, and just at least mask up, that this will greatly help uh, here in the community. And with that, I'll take any questions. Um. Back on your numbers to start uh, for yesterday, I think uh, the the memo that uh, Hannah sent out said 59 new cases were were was the number from yesterday uh, that she released. Did that number include those numbers that that you got late yesterday? So or that not? number included that 59 was from our report on Friday till Monday, and that didn't include the additional 11 that we got after the report. Okay, so we started out with 11 before we ever got the 59, <laughs> so to speak, for, for the coming well, Wednesday, for tomorrow. Right, Yeah. right. And so okay. that 11 is not in these numbers, Right. but I okay. have it on my trend there just so that you can see what that daily total was for that, that total cases yesterday. <clears throat> and that they're picking up this morning with ones that they weren't able to finish getting to yesterday. Well, I, I guess the only thing that I will add to any of it is, and I'll just it's piggybacking on to what you say, if, if more people would uh, wear the mask, uh, it, it would help. Our numbers would go down. I think that shows with the western uh, Kansas counties that uh, have had not had a mask mandate, and all of a sudden their, their numbers are soaring. I mean, I, I figured that the population of a couple, three of the counties out west, uh, I mean, their, their infectious rate is about 6 or 7 percent of their total population. And we're still at about one and a half, I think, or somewhere right around there. So just my crude way of looking at them. Other comments from commissioners? Jason, something that was concerning that you said was mm -hmm. the uh, <clears throat> the verbal abuse and such that you're 
that your staff is being uh, subjected to. Yes, sir. Are, are you, uh, do you have anything in place as far as support, uh, helping them how to cope with this and uh, how to work through this? And We do. Uh, we have a couple things right now, and I'm still working on a couple of other ones. One of them we have is a what we call the um, uh, respite room is a place that they can be able to go and decompress away from all of that and just have um, some quiet space to try and deal with that because some of it can be quite brutal sometimes. Um, we have also, um, oh, oh, the other thing I ended up doing, um, just so that all staff were aware that it was okay, is that when that kind of behavior is happening, that they uh, are to warn the client that, you know, this, this kind of abuse cannot, or, you know, this kind of uh, uh, language cannot continue in order for us to be able to um, uh, you know, have this conversation and if this continues then we will have to end this call and try and, and connect again later. Um, and so putting that into an internal policy just so that they know that um, you know, there are steps that they can take to try and deal with it without feeling like they have to sit there for 15 minutes and be um, you know, verbally berated up one side and down the other and just have to take it. It, it truly saddens me that they're being subjected to this and uh, I, I wish the public would understand the goal and objective of these, uh, these people and the job they're doing. But. Well, and the other thing for people to really understand too is that you know, my investigators are just trying to do their job. It's not um, until, you know, somebody at the level of the WHO, the CDC, or KDHE either declares that the coronavirus pandemic is over or that we're not going to investigate it anymore, which I don't see happening anytime soon, then we have to investigate. We have to go through these isolation and quarantine. We have to do these things. Um, and it's, it's not in our hands to say that we're just not going to do that anymore. Does it ever rise to the level of uh, criminal activity, the threats? Not yet, thankfully. Okay. That's why I said borderline. Um, we have had a couple that have been, I think, probably getting close to that. Um, but no, thankfully it hasn't risen to that level yet. And those phone calls aren't recorded, I assume? Unfortunately, no. Okay. The 12.7 monthly positive rate, um, Am I wrong in saying that they kind of want that down around the two to three range? You know, is that wrong? Have I heard uh, that they wrong? They want it under five. Under five, okay. Which uh, there is nowhere, nowhere in Kansas right now that is anywhere near, I believe, under five. You know, your point about 59 people might not sound a lot. It, it really is a lot in, in, the, in the fact that we're not only, the business community is not only dealing with those 59, they're dealing with everybody else that has to quarantine that's around them. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I know in our situation, we've almost had to close because we've been unable to, to open up uh, or, you know, find enough people. So it is, it's a huge impact to the business community out there. So, And we understand the impact. I mean, we've had staff that has had to quarantine because of either, you know, a family exposure or something like that. So, I mean, we are not immune to it, and we've had to deal with it as well. All right. Are there any uh, further questions or comments from commissioners? Mr. Chair, I was originally came in here thinking I was going to amend my motion to have this not be every two weeks because this is obviously not going away. I have changed my mind a little bit because I just feel like we get information and it's a chance for us to get the word out to the public every two weeks. It's not my intention to, to look at this and maybe in two weeks have this go away. It's not going away for a while, but I do like the every two weeks if, it's, if it doesn't take you away from your work at the... At the uh, no, and with the changing information, I think that, um, I mean, we could even see last month we had stuff at the beginning of the month, and as we got closer to Halloween, there was some new stuff. And I expect that as we get closer to Thanksgiving, we'll probably have some additional um, guidance or information because predictability beyond probably the next, you know, any, any, at any time beyond a couple weeks is, is very difficult. So. Okay. 
Okay, um, as this is a resolution, uh, we really don't need to take a vote, but I do need to make sure that we have a consensus of the, uh, the Board of Commissioners that we will continue with the mask mandate, and I will look to each one of you with a nod of the head and see if that's your... Your, uh, yes. And that does look to be unanimous uh, consensus. So we will continue with the uh, mask mandate for Saline County. And thank you, Jason. Uh, we'll move to item number two. RFA number 250-20, a resolution 20-2310, appointment of alternate health officers, Jason Tiller, health department director. All right, the floor is yours, Jason. All right, good morning again. So one of the tenets of continuity of operations is having uh, key, or key personnel appointed at least three deep. So that way if, if you're one of your primary staff or your key staff in a response either dies, is ill, incapacitated, whatever, somebody can be able to seamlessly step up and take on those duties. Um, generally, that only requires us to list their names in a continuity of operations plan. However, because the health officer is a position that is appointed, um, in order to have two uh, alternates identified as health officers, that we then have to appoint them. Um, to this end, I'm requesting that Dr. David Dupey be appointed as alternate health officer one and Dr. Freelo Robert Freelove uh, be appointed as alternate health officer two. Uh, both of them have agreed to this and then if this is approved, they will take the oath of office um, and then be bonded and we can cover the, the fee for the bonding of both of them from the uh, health department administrative budget. Um, so you have the resolution here that says, whereas KSA 65201 requires the appointment of a county health officer who shall perform the duties and responsibilities statutorily prescribed for the office and who shall serve in an advisory capacity to the County Board of Health. And whereas Jason Tiller is director of the Saline County Health Department is a qualified local health program administrator, he is a qualified person was appointed as the Saline County Health Officer on August 27, 2019 whereas the Saline County Board of County Commissioners recognize the importance of continuity of operations and the need to appoint two alternate health officers. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Saline County, Kansas, that the following are appointed to serve as alternate Saline County health officer uh, to be effective today upon and upon taking the oath. So you have the alternates there. Of course, um, alternatives for action uh, would be to choose to appoint other alternatives um, or appoint the ones that we have requested. Um, staff recommendation uh, is to appoint both of these as alternate health officers and provide that continuity of operations during this pandemic. Um, and as mentioned previously, the total budget impact would be $1,000, which we have within our administrative uh, section of our budget. Okay, believe it or not, uh, this very thing was on my mind for the last couple of weeks, you know, as, you know, various people in various organizations fall ill, you know, uh, where, where were we at? And that was, I'm glad you've taken this step. And, and my second point is uh, the people that are involved here. I mean, in this case, I mean, I think most doctors would be a, a great alternate for us. In the middle of a pandemic when we have uh, close contact with uh, Solano Regional, and both of these people are key people, both these doctors are key uh, to Solano Regional, I think they're excellent uh, choices. And uh, my recommendation is to my fellow commissioners is that we do do this, and we do appoint these two. So at this time, I would ask other commissioners to, do they have any comments? Is there any public comment on this RFA? If not, I'll bring it back to the Commission for Action. Mr. Chairman, I move we adopt Resolution 20-2310, appointing two alternates to serve as Sling County Health Officer as presented. Second the motion. That's been moved and seconded that we approve RFA 250-20, Resolution 20-2310, appointment of alternate health officers. Is there any further comments? If not, all of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Post same sign. The motion carries 5-0. Jason, thank you for taking the time to come see us and uh, bring us the information. We will move to uh, item number three. RFA number 249-20, declare items of no value. Hannah Stambaugh, Deputy County Administrator. Good morning, Hannah. 
Good morning, commissioners. This is a request for action from the Sling County Livestock and Expo Center, as well as the uh, Department of Senior Services. The Expo Center has got a list of items that they wish to have declared no value and to set up a sale on Purple Wave. And then Senior Services has got an ice machine that uh, is broken and not repairable, as well as a refrigerator that is not repairable that they wish to have declared no value and to be disposed of. Your alternatives are for the declaration of the items of no value and authorize the sale of Purple Wave for the Expo Center items and disposal of the items for senior services or not declare those. The staff recommends the declaration of all items no value and to authorize the Purple Wave sale. All of these items were sent out to Sling County Departments as well as the rural fire districts just before this request for action to ensure that there weren't any, weren't any other departments that could utilize these items. Um, the Purple Wave auction, if authorized, would be set for sometime in December, and any of the proceeds of the sale of items would be deposited into the general fund. Questions from commissioners? Do they have anything? Any comments? All right, I will ask for public comment if there is any. Bring it back to the commission for action. Mr. Chairman, I move we declare the items of no value as presented by staff. Second motion. It's been moved and seconded that we approve RFA 249-20, declare items of no value. Any further comments? All of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, the motion carries. Uh, item number four. RFA number 251-20, Conference of Radiation Control Program, Director Radon Mini Grant, Hannah Stanbaum, Deputy County Administrator. Okay, Hannah. Good morning again. So this request comes from the Sling County Planning and Zoning and Environmental Health Department. So we learned of a potential grant opportunity and submitted a uh, proposal and received notification that we were awarded $4,500 from the Conference of Radiation Control Program Director Grant to conduct activities of outreach, education, radon prevention and mitigation um, for 2020 and 2021. Your alternatives for action today are to accept the $4,500 grant and allow for our staff to continue the plan in regards to the grant application of conducting training on radon, purchasing short-term kits, the recalibration of two of our radon monitors, uh, perform evaluations on existing and new homes, and conduct activities for Radon Action Month that is scheduled in January of 2021 or not to accept the grant. Staff recommendation is to accept the grant of $4,500. This will aid us in the financial support needed to have these activities of education to monitor the radon situation in the Saline County area. These grant funds were not anticipated, and these funds will be strictly used to enhance already existing radon activities and expand our services. And the way that this grant is set up, a total of $2,000 is provided up front, and then the remaining $2,500 is reimbursable upon the submission of receipts. The way that this grant would work is that it needs to be expended by August 15th of 2021. Anna, uh, <clears throat> when, when is this conference? It's not a conference, it's just the name of the organization that is offering these mini, these mini grants. Okay, all right. Uh, questions or comments from commissioners? Does this involve any matching funds? It does not. Further comments? Any public comment? I'm bringing it back to the commission for action. Mr. Chairman, I move we accept by signature the radon grant as presented. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we approve RFA 251-20, Conference of Radiation Control Program Director, uh, Radon Mini Grant. Any further comments? All of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. And thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Uh, we'll move to item number five. RFA number 252-20, Amendment to Coronavirus Relief Fund, Memorandum of Understanding with the Salina Chamber Foundation, Smil Philip Smith-Haynes, County Administrator. Good morning, Philip. Good morning. So I find myself in an odd 
position this morning, which is um, we have great news that puts us in a pickle. And what I mean by that is, as your commission is aware, we received $11,026,434 in coronavirus relief funding and appointed a committee that reviewed applications, which were subsequently approved by your commission and then uh, subsequently by the state of Kansas, for how we would spend that funds to support uh, folks here in the community that had experienced impacts from the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the things that we wanted to prioritize was uh, reimbursements or uh, supplemental funding to businesses that had experienced business losses, particularly related to the stay-at-home order that uh, was in place earlier this spring. And so to that end, uh, the advisory committee recommended and subsequently your commission and the state approved uh, allocation of just about $2.7 million to the Salina Area Chamber of Commerce Foundation, which would be used to make uh, grants of up to $25,000 to businesses that had experienced losses of 25% uh, of gross revenues. Here's the good news. Not enough businesses have experienced that kind of loss. Businesses in Saline County uh, have not uh, experienced losses of that magnitude or have been able to um, come up with other sources of funding. So uh, to date, we have only approved $675,000 toward the uh, grant program for the Chamber Foundation. That's great news. The problem is we have another $2 million to spend on COVID relief in this community somehow. And we're getting uh, close to that deadline, closer every day to that deadline. So in conversations with uh, Eric Brown from the Chamber Foundation and in conversations with our state technical advisor, uh, we've hit upon the idea of, okay, let's tweak the program requirements a little bit and see if we can expand both the pool of eligible businesses and the amount of money that those businesses are eligible for and hopefully get some more of that money out the door. That serves the goal of the program to assist local businesses that have been impacted by the pandemic. Uh, the changes that uh, Eric wrote up were reviewed by our uh, Coronavirus Relief Funding Advisory Committee and recommended for uh, your commission's adoption last Wednesday. So those changes include reducing the threshold for what qualifies a business from a 25% loss to a 15% loss, increasing the funding per employee from $2,500 to $5,000, and increasing the maximum amount of award per business from $25,000 to $50,000. So um, we believe, the Chamber Foundation believes that by doing, uh, making those changes, there will be more businesses that will qualify, more businesses that will apply, and uh, other existing businesses that have um, already been approved, we'll be able to draw down more funds as well. So uh, we're hopeful that this will help get the money out. Um, I will say that the uh, Funding Advisory Committee is also reviewing other ways to um, expend the funds if we don't come up with $2.7 million in business assistance. And uh, we are meeting again tomorrow to, to continue that review. So um, 
that is the recommendation today. Obviously, uh, you have alternatives for action, the first being uh, to amend the MOU with the Chamber Foundation to incorporate those changes that I've outlined, or to not agree to the proposed changes and direct staff to seek alternatives for expending the coronavirus relief funds. Staff recommends that you accept the proposed changes. As I said, um, the advisory committee is in concurrence with that. Um, and uh, Eric Brown is, is here if you have any other questions that I haven't addressed. I'd be happy to answer any questions from the commission. Um, Eric, would you like to, to expand on that before we ask questions or does that pretty well cover, cover the, the basis and the gig gamut, I presume? It does, yes. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'll, I'll let the commissioners uh, have at it. Uh, a couple questions. <clears throat> Is there a is there a deadline with with the Chamber Foundation to have these uh, in? So if there is, and then B can monies not uh, allocated there come back to where other entities can use it? Yes. So um, the overall deadline for expending the funds is uh, December thirtieth, and so. For our subrecipients, including the Chamber Foundation, we've said we need their receipts by December 23rd in order to get the funding process by December 30th. Um, more realistically, we're trying to get folks to spend their money by the 1st of December so that we know um, if there's anything left over that we can allocate. The Chamber is accepting, the Chamber Foundation is accepting applications on a rolling basis. Per our original MOU with them, which is not changing, if they have funding left over for, from their $2.7 million by November 15th, they will um, look to fund not only for-profit businesses, but also some of the non-profits in the community that have experienced losses as well. So there was a built-in mechanism to expand the pool that way. Um, Eric has indicated that they will go ahead and start taking applications from those nonprofits now, just so they have them teed up for funding on November 15th. Um, and uh, to address your second question, Commissioner, yes. So that is exactly where uh, the advisory committee is at this time, is thinking about, okay, we, not, we, we, we think we're gonna have a pool of funding left over. It's not just the Chamber Foundation. We have one of our local school districts who has indicated to me that they don't think they're gonna expend everything that was allocated to them as well. So we don't know what that amount of money is going to be, but we are saying, um, okay, what is our game plan for expending whatever amount is left over? Um, we are looking at, um, potentially throwing out a supplemental application um, that we could uh, get folks who may not have applied in the first round for whatever reason, didn't know about it, experienced a loss after the first round, et cetera, um, as well as uh, re-examining some of the things that were not funded originally um, to, to try and see um, what we could do with whatever is left over. One, one more question, and I might not have the correct terminology, but uh, there was a, a while back a federal program. Is it PPP? Is that mm -hmm. uh, where, where businesses could apply for some, uh, for some monies and such? If they receive that, does that uh, negate? It does not automatically disqualify them from receiving funding under the, the chamber's program. The chamber is asking about whether they have received funding. It wasn't just the PPP, there was also the HERO, there's the CDBG that uh, Hannah's been talking to you about. There are a number of federal and state programs that have been out there. Um, so the chamber uh, is asking about whether they've received money and how much money because there is a, a limit. I, I, I believe that number is around 350,000. That's sort of like they have to stay under that in total federal funding. Um, so the chamber's uh, asking that question, but they're not automatically disqualified. One more then. I'm sorry. 
the businesses that have questions, they can contact the chamber and, and explain this and you can walk them through it. Is that correct? Okay. Absolutely, and the information is on our website as well as on the chamber's website. My question, uh, responsibility for accurate information, uh, you know, if, if the, the, the numbers that someone puts on their application, who's responsible for making sure those are accurate and how do you do it? Um, so ultimately the business is responsible. So the, um, so uh, sort of like the chain of responsibility flows downhill, I guess you would say. So the state of Kansas is the recipient of the coronavirus relief grant funds from the federal government. So they are responsible for monitoring each of the county programs. Uh, your commission is responsible for the county program per the resolution that you passed. You have transferred a portion of that risk to each of the sub-recipients, including the Chamber Foundation. And then the Chamber Foundation also enters into an agreement with each of the individual businesses in order to receive the funding. So, If, if there was a, a fraudulent uh, situation where someone did t was found to be, you know, mis- uh, representing their numbers, uh, can that ultimately come back on the county if we haven't done our homework or? Uh, it, it could, um, absolutely, N and not just with businesses, but with any of our uh, uh, programs that we've, uh, you know, if, if the city of Salina did something that wasn't kosher uh, with the funding that we approved for them, that ultimately could come back on um, the county, but as I said, we have um, attempted to transfer that risk to subrecipients because they have agreed to assume um, all or a portion of that risk. So um, that's what the state did to us, and then what we've done with with subrecipients. So, all right. Further questions or comments from commissioners? An RFA is in effect, so are there any, is there any public comment? We'll bring it back to the Commission for action. Mr. Chair, I move we amend the MOU with the Chamber Foundation to incorporate the changes as, as proposed. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we approve RFA 252-20 amendment to uh, CRF MOU with the uh, Solano Chamber Foundation. Further comments? All of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Motion does carry. Uh, Mr. Brown, thank you very much for attending, number one, and thank you for helping Saline County and, and all of the business community for, for distributing these funds. And uh, I know it's a, it's a great deal of work on your part, too, but it, it is badly needed. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. We'll move to uh, item number six. Election Worker Appreciation Day <clears throat> Proclamation. I'm Cheryl Blake, Deputy <clears throat> County Clerk. A proclamation declaring Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020 as Election Worker Appreciation Day. Whereas the long hours Saline County election workers spend training and preparing for their 14-hour shifts at the polls on Election Day are unseen by most members of the public. And whereas Saline County election workers serve to protect universal suffrage and the fair and open conduct of transparent elections. And whereas Saline County election workers deserve the public's thanks for the selfless personal commitment to protect the right of every citizen to cast a secret ballot. Now therefore let it be known that the Board of County Commissioners of Saline County, Kansas does hereby proclaim Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020 to be Election Worker Appreciation Day throughout Saline County. Any comments from commissioners? Uh, this, is, this is very appropriate. On, a, on, a, on an important day to the not just Saline, Solano, Saline County, but all of all of our country. So uh, there has been a lot of bustle. I don't, we had what 10,000 or more uh, advance votes too. So pretty important. So any other comments from commissioners? If not, I will take a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we proclaim today as Election Worker Appreciation Day. 
Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we proclaim today as the Election Worker Appreciation Day. All of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Thank you, and thanks to everyone who works on the election. Uh, we will move into the uh, informational item portion of our meeting. Uh, item number one. Idle fund report. Jennifer Frazier, Deputy Treasurer. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning. I am the Deputy Treasurer for Jim Du Bois, County Treasurer. He wanted me to come share the interest earnings report for the quarter ending September 30th of 30th of 2020. As of September 30th, we have 68,795.31 earnings for the third quarter. Uh, making an interest as of the third quarter $331,084.71, which is rather down, but comparing it to the 2017 overall the year, it's uh, ahead of that for this day and age. All right, questions from commissioners? I too share that you're concerned that uh, it's down, but. Uh, that's something that someone else controls other than <laughs> exactly. us. So. Exactly. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank, Thank you. you. Pardon? I do have a question. For you. All right. Hang on just a second. No, I need four more for Phil. Uh, is this about in line in, in, in what we budgeted, uh, the thoughts, knowing that the interest on idle funds is going to be lower? Um, it's not in line with the 2020 budget. We were quite optimistic in the 2020 budget based on what we had seen in 2019. It is in line with what we did for 2021. And it is in line with, with um, what we anticipated uh, when we did our estimates for end of 2020. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. We will move to uh, item number two. Road and Bridge update, Darren Fischel, Administrator. Good morning, Darren. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is our bi-monthly update for September, October. Um, we did have one snow and ice event on October 25th through 27th. We went out and, and, and treated roads for some freezing rain and then some refreezing overnight. Um, we did set three generators at our yard. Um, we were able to purchase this one earlier this year for our main uh, shop area. It's large enough to run the whole building plus capacity for continuity of government if that should happen that people need to come out and work at our facility. This generator came from the uh, juvenile center, was uh, transferred out to our facility and it will run the engineering building. And this is the old generator that we, re we the older generator that we took from the shop and moved it to our uh, traffic control building. So when this one is hooked up right now, these two are in the process of being, so this will be the first time our facility has been able to have full power when we have an electrical uh, outage due to an ice storm or any other such event. Um, we rebuilt a mile and a half of gravel roads in the Sundowner West subdivision. These are the before pictures as you see the the road elevation had decreased significantly significantly over the years to where the driveways were higher than the road and the uh, water was not able to get to the ditch so we went in there uh, re-elevated the roadways and um, and then re-graveled them. So as you can see the road crown is higher than the driveway so when the water comes this way it will want to go to the ditch instead of the road. <clears throat> this is a culvert that we replaced there too. We, nobody knew it was there so we, we, we replaced it with a new culvert to transfer the water to the other side of the roadway. Um, we replaced 23 cross road and entrance culverts. Um, this was uh, some of the, the, some of the, not all of them, but a few of the things that we typically find out there. Um, this, this gentleman here had installed a uh, polyurethane pipe uh, that's not in accordance with our policy. 
But uh, we went ahead and replaced it because it, the, the culvert that he took out was not um, in any good shape. But we were able to take remove two culverts and replace it with one. Um, if we go back to this picture here, um, we made a mound entrance here and, and that didn't require a culvert and then we installed one culvert downstream. This is just a, a picture of, of typically how we discover uh, damage to a culvert. Uh, most of it you can't see, it's under the roadway, but most of the time a hole will appear in the roadway. And that's typically how we know, uh, one of the ways that we know the culvert's bad, either the rural patrolman or a citizen will call into us. And this, this shows you the damage, especially in the western part of the county where the soil is acidic. Um, this is the reason about a decade ago we went to aluminized culverts. They, they offer better protection against rust. This is the bottom of a culvert and, and what will happen is the bottom will rust out. Um, usually because of it either sits there in the water or just the acidity of the soils. You can see this one here that came out, you can see the sunlight down here. So this one isn't in much better shape either. Um, here's a, a culvert that uh, we dug out and this is typically what happens when they get to this point right here. It's a replacement event. There's, by the time you dig this out the, and try to clean it or flush it with anything, you'll find that most of the time the bottom's rusted out also. So with the price of the culvert, it's cheaper just to dig that out and repair it than to try to spend a day or two flushing it out. This is what that looks like. And, and then whenever we get the opportunity, we remove culverts. And doing that other culvert, we, we found this one. Um, talking to the property owner, he said they don't use it anymore. So that takes that maintenance expense off because you can see why they don't use it. There's a power pole right here. It's very narrow. So no ability for anybody to turn a semi or even any, any heavy farm equipment that's preve prevalent these days. Um, this is a culvert at the intersection of, of Armstrong and Powers. And this is some ditch work on uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the road, but uh, we get visitors once in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they come out and watch the guys work. Most of them, most of them are pretty harmless, but they want to see what's going on. So that's just a picture of some of the ditch cleaning. Um, this is a mile of uh, Cunningham Road between Schilling and Waterwell. This was an area where um, we had a spring. There was a spring in the roadway that was continually. Uh, costing us money in aggregate because there's not a whole lot you can do but put more aggregate. So we went in and we dug out all the clay down to, well I'm not going to call it bedrock because um, it's more of a shale in Saline County. And we installed this perforated pipe. This perforated pipe um, has a sock around it so water can still drain into it. Uh, they call it, a, it's called a French drain. And then uh, there were two spring areas, so we excavated that and laid this French drain in there and then covered it with a half inch chip, which allows the water to penetrate and get down into the drain. And then we covered that with um, what's called GeoGrid. And if you remember a few months ago, we purchased some GeoGrid on a Purple Wave auction. This is a way to put an aggregate product in it and, and it locks it together and spreads the weight of the, the truck axles and, and equipment over, over a larger area. And on top of that, we put six inches of, of rock, which was compacted and watered. And then, and then the project was seeded. We did this, we didn't put the French drains in the whole mile, but the whole mile was rebuilt where the ditches were pulled. And this is looking up that hill. And then this is just a recent picture showing we are getting some, some foliage growth to uh, help the erosion. 
and we also edge wedge six miles of asphalt road with an aggregate material. This is old 81 uh, going north of Salina towards the Ottawa County line. Um, these roads up here are narrow and what we get is a lot of uh, uh, farm equipment that, that uses this shoulder, you know, because of the width of it, they, they have to drive on it to, to stay on the road. This is Simpson Road looking uh, north from Crawford Street. This is uh, Crawford Street looking west from Simpson Road. And it's just a picture of, of how we do it. This is, this is our shoulder machine. We put it on the front of a motor grader, back a truck up to it, and then it, it spreads the aggregate out. So there's not a lot of loss. Instead of just dumping it on the road and then blading it out, it actually places the material. Oh, this is a uh, an accident we had uh, um, experienced on our county roadways during harvest. This is a, a a box structure. This is not a bridge, so it's not rated. Um, uh, this particular combine tried to get across there, and he didn't make it. Um, probably would have been all right if he'd have stayed on that rail right there, but the tires got between the rail and this, this concrete wasn't enough to hold it up. But we did something different here. Um, we got with uh, the engineer and this is what we put in place of that. This, uh, to build a box there probably would have been in the nature of fifty or sixty thousand dollars. We purchased this for about ten thousand uh, dollars with delivery at, I mean, that's just a rough estimate but it was less than that and this is a railroad tank car there's a company that uh, cuts these in half and then they put these head walls on them and they put a steel floor in them they don't work in every place but this one was suitable this is an earth road that's very important to the community down there because just north of here there's a 12 ton bridge that they can't or shouldn't take their their stuff across it. So this is really is for their heavy agriculture equipment their only access. So this is that uh, that tank uh, car being being buried and compacted. Uh, there's, and then this is a picture of the final. We did some tree work here and straightened the ditches up to uh, improve the the flow. Um, we, re, uh, we did multiple laybacks um, during harvest and between harvests and we repaired or replaced 97 signs. Um, we did complete the yearly wide uh, county pavement marking, which is striping, and we hauled 4,065 ton of rock, 4,773 ton of AB3, and 3,480 ton of sand. Most of that AB3 was for the shouldering. We have, we have about 10 culverts that we need to replace yet. We're just, with the, the leaves falling off the trees, we're gonna start our winter tree work and vegetation control projects uh, around, cutting around bridges. Uh, we have about 200 ton of rock to haul, 300 ton of sand, and about 150 ton of AB3. Our budgets are in line with the historical average. Our aggregate line items are depleted but we have a full supply of aggregates in the yard, which is pretty typical. Uh, it's been dry, so. Darren, over the last year, uh, <clears throat> I've been a proponent of, uh, of prioritizing uh, a plan to uh, where, where we go with the rock and where we go with our sand and so forth, rather than someone just uh, the, the real patrolman all of a sudden says well we need some rock out here and they put it on a list uh, and then it doesn't get taken care of have we have we pursued this uh, with the with our IT department as far as putting a program together to identify some of these to get it out there quicker or where it hasn't been you know where the delivery hasn't been for 60 90 days you know I have I have talked with Brad about that and he wanted to get with me and come up with a, a program that we could identify those and not necessarily just just haul it out there because right. it hasn't been hauled out there and, right. and try to get somebody to go look at them or say tell the rural patrolman we're, we're working on that well I know that I mean you know over time that uh, that you've been out and I've been with you and you said oh, yeah here's my sheet yeah this should have this has been or uh, rocks been in order out here for 90 days mm -hmm. well now we're a year into this and we're still working on it I no. would I would ask you to 
put the foot on the metal here and, and uh, get something done with it. Due to the dry weather, we have caught up a lot. Um, but you know, with the, the look at uh, what we have to haul, it's, that's, that's pretty minimal for our department. And I would, I would say, just in general, um, we've made some, because of the flooding, we've made some strides this year. It takes about two years to uh, recover from a flood. The first year, you spend most of your time repairing the damage from the flood. And then the second year, you spend um, catching up to what you neglected because you were working on the flood. Right. And, and um, because this commission has been very proactive in, in truck purchases, we haven't had those breakdowns either. So we've been able to uh, move forward that way. Well, I, I get all that. But it seems like our, our real complaints come from uh, areas that, uh, yeah, rock's been ordered. We just haven't gotten it out here, and uh, we need we need a we need a program that identifies this to to you know tell you guys. I mean, you, we got a 1,100 miles of road or thereabouts. I understand that you can't don't have that in your head, but somewhere along the line with the IT department, there needs to be a program that we can put together and identify this stuff and you know a, a tickle file, if you will, that says. Gosh, this rock was ordered out here for 30 days. 30 days ago, we need to, to step on it. And I know Muir Road was one of those last year that got caught up in that. And once we looked at it, oh yeah, shoot, it was ordered 90 days ago. So, anyway, that's my comment. Yeah, quick uh, question, Darren. Uh, what do you, what's tonnage do do your dump trucks? About 15. Yes. So you are 20, 30. About a little over 40 truckloads from meeting what needs to be done for. Is this for the year? This is just for everything what we that's have. on the books. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're we're pretty close. We're within a couple of days of just just being caught up. Okay. That's, well, that's one one, one rain event away from being way behind again, though, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we'll take the rain, but no, yeah, that's for sure. Uh, before I go any further, I'm a, this this trailer that was uh, on uh, Expo Center's Purple Wave. It looks like a heavy-duty trailer to me. I mean, is that something that Road and Bridge, rather than sell this thing at a greatly reduced price, can you go take a look at that, or have you seen it? Um, I have seen it. I, I looked at that, and I sent Brian over there to look at it also. And Brian's on vacation this week. I haven't haven't. Seen him yet. Uh, that having been said, is it something that you guys would be able to put in your fleet out there and use it as, as a? You know, without Brian or or because I, I, what's missing from that picture is a picture of the hitch. Yeah. I don't know what type of hitch that is. I'm going to assume a pedal hitch, but I don't know that. For uh, sure. I, just based on the uh, tongue, with the, what's about five inch uh, I beams or five inch channel, it, it's probably got one of those. It doesn't have a regular trailer here. It's just got a. We are looking at it. So okay, because I would sure hate to see us send that down the road for, you know, that's probably a twenty thousand dollar trailer or something to that effect. Maybe not that much. More like ten thousand dollar trailer, but somebody's going to buy it on Purple Way for fifteen hundred bucks. Right. So. Other comments from commissioners regarding the road and bridge department. If not, uh, thank you very much, and we'll move to item number three. County Engineer Update, Justin Mader, County Engineer. Good morning, Justin. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm going to provide an update on um, what engineering has going on. I believe our last, my last update was in August, and so this will just be an update from, from last August. So what I'm going to start with is um, 2020, uh, and you have a map up there on the uh, the uh, wall <clears throat> and I will start with the projects that we've completed um, so the first project that I'm gonna uh, mention is a water well road reconstruction project it really it's an upgrade from a gravel road to a paved road uh, between light or Burma and Lightville and we were able to do that for a cost of six hundred ninety thousand dollars and some change uh, the second project is a culvert replacement project on Salemsburg Road, west of Holmes Road. And, and when I say culvert project, there were two culverts, about two 48-inch pipes at this location, and we replaced those with one 10-foot diameter um, 
steel t uh, steel pipe that was uh, created from a, a railroad tanker. In a sense, it was the picture that Darren showed you before with the the, the half tank, and so this is just the, the the full tank on that. So we did that project for uh, just a little under fifty eight thousand dollars. For our uh, hot mix asphalt overlay projects, um, we completed those. We do have um, a couple shouldering projects um, on that yet to, to finish that out, but as of right now, we're at $1,060,819. Um, but what I did is I split out the cost for Old Highway 40 between Niles and Solomon Road. And, and what I did is, because this project is um, about as most straightforward as a project for a two inch overlay. I wanted to see and you know, break that out to a cost per mile so we can kind of compare that to our chip seal. Um, and I'll get to that later. But so I, I pulled out the cost for that and for a just a straightforward conventional two inch overlay um, with shoulders on that is um, about $150,000 a mile. And so that's that's what you can kind of think of for a, uh, for an overlay on that. Uh, other projects that we did was on Centennial Road from Waterwell Road uh, north, a half a mile, and that was a joint project with the city. That's one of the projects that still needs to have a shouldering uh, shoulder placed on it. Uh, four Street from uh, Old Highway 81 east to the Asarius city limits uh, was a project and we actually added on kind of later on in the year. Um, and that project also needs to be shouldered as well. And then this year was a was the year where we just did a lot of small projects kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, several low water crossings where instead of putting in a, uh, a pipe or a, some other drainage structure, the road was lowered, you know, way back in the day. And when there was a um, an asphalt road um, was placed, you know, a couple hundred feet to where the water would go over the road. And so those haven't had much attention um, on, uh, placed on them for quite a while and so it was time to we, we just deal with with a lot of those as well as some other uh, approaches to pavement pavement roads we, we added on to that. Uh, so the next project that we finished up was all of our uh, chip seal projects. Um, all of the projects were completed for a total of $970,000 and uh, 431 cent er, Sorry, $970,431. Um, and then I, I broke that down to a cost per mile. Um, and that is at $21,774. So you just think, you know, $22,000 for a chip seal. And why do I bring this up? Every year when you do a chip seal, everyone calls and complains about a chip seal because they like asphalt. Um, and so these are kind of good numbers to, to put in your your pocket when someone's talking to you about, hey, I don't want a chip seal, I want an overlay. Well, you're looking at $150,000 per mile for an overlay versus $22,000 per mile for a chip seal. And so that's the reason why we have to have a chip seal program and not just overlay everything. It just boils down to, to um, dollars and cents. Um, so, so I wanted to, to provide that um, dollar value to you, and I'm going to try to keep that yeah. updated every year, just so you guys are aware. I, I think our resistance to the chip seal has been as as a new construction, uh, like it was out on uh, Waterwell East Waterwell, oh, sure. when we go in, and that's there wasn't an asphalt mm -hmm. there to begin with. When we have started with a chip seal, and one year later, we've got a torn up road yes yeah you know and and, and we had some uh, didn't have a very good chip seal last year uh, we made some changes to the specs we you know we changed the rock gradation uh, which we're using a different oil and I'm very very pleased with the uh, performance of our chip seals this year and so uh, so we've had less complaints than we did last year um, last year it was um, you know we had some rock retention issues um, you know and so there was a lot more complaints but it's still every year people see that that rock um, going down on the road for chip seals and and they want to know and so I think it's always good to have have the the, the reason why we chip seal and not overlay um, everything so okay so now I'm gonna move on to our uncompleted um, 
projects, and these are, are contractual projects. These are projects that my office works um, and, and designs and puts together that we bid out for a contractor. So um, the, the first set of projects is the reinforced concrete box projects. And what you'll see on the map is those are the light blue circles on the map. I know it's kind of hard to see um, up on the wall, but you should have an 11 by 17 map um, in front of you as well. Uh, we've got uh, five locations here that Reese Construction was the low bid on, and the, the bid was for $586,934.90. Um, these have been awarded here quite a while ago, and uh, Reese just hasn't begun on the, those yet. They did tell me that they were going to be starting November 1st. Now, November 1st has come and, and um, gone past, and they haven't quite started yet. Um, I've got staff trying to reach out to them to try to get a um, uh, an updated start date. Uh, so hopefully we'll we'll get that. But they'll, their plan was to start on the project on Cloud Cloud Street. So um, the next one is our pavement crack seal. This project was awarded to Pavement Pros uh, for $104,974.14. Again, they stated uh, that they were going to start on November 1st. They haven't started yet, and so I've got staff trying to reach out to them to try to get an uh, update on, on their start time. And then um, finally is our, our aggregate shouldering projects, and it's the green line on the map. Uh, APAC was awarded this project for $134,085, and that is to just add a shouldering edge wedge uh, to Burma Road from the McPherson County line north two miles, and then on Don Meyer Road from uh, between Country Club and Old Highway 40. And so the last time they gave an update on that, they were going to start here in the middle of November. So there's some a couple projects uh, that we've been working on that I did not put on the map um, just because I want to include them in this update because it has taken a significant amount of, of time in the office and the design and so I want to mention that that's kind of something else that we've been working on. Uh, the first one is a it's a high risk rural road funded project which is federal dollars being administered through KDOT but that is the um, Oh, the, the road upgrade, it's to add shoulders and to regrade ditches, flatter, flatter ditches uh, to have a, a, a little safer, more traversable um, ditch slopes. And that's on Simpson Road between Magnolia and Crawford. Uh, we've been working on that. We've got field check plans submitted to KDOT. Uh, however, we're not really looking for a construction project until 2022 on that. Uh, another project, another set of projects that we've been working on for a while is the, the FEMA projects, and these are our mitigation projects. Um, I've got five five locations around the county. I believe I have all the documentation submitted to KDOT, uh, or not, sorry, not KDOT, to FEMA. Um, with FEMA, you never know when they're going to need more information. Um, you know, so it's always something that I'm, I'm you know, needing to provide more data on. Um, I, I'm pretty confident that we're going to get funded for all these, and, and I'm anticipating around a million dollars of, of funds, uh, you know, from FEMA. So it's a, it's a significant um, project for me, you know, that I, that when they when they need the information, I kind of drop everything and, and get them what they need, so we can keep this process moving forward. Uh, a couple other items that I listed on here that we're always kind of working on throughout the year, it never really stops, um, is uh, bridge inspections, culvert inspections, and small structure inspections. I know with the bridge inspections, those are the, um, what I'm talking about there is the, um, the federal definition of a bridge. And so every two years, we've got to do a, uh, a full inspection and, and follow all the KDOT's procedures. And we're going to be starting that again here um, in January and February. So also uh, we've been working on the the road upgrade uh, program. Uh, I know we've we've had some work sessions with the commissioners, um, and I'm I'm ready to kind of have that next step to present a list of um, present a proposed projects to you, and I'll be doing that here very very shortly. So if you don't have any questions on the 2020, um, I can move on to the 2021 program. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, I'd like to. S do you know 
like where you're talking about the chip and seal on these roads, when the last time that those were had uh, the chip and seal put on them, and uh, on the ones you're cracking, I mean, uh, doing the. I, I, uh, to be honest with you, I couldn't tell you right now. We we have tracked that. Um, you know, one of the first things that I did is is we went. I had staff to go back in time, and to to determine you know when roads were. Um, chip sealed when the time the last time it was overlaid you know so that way we yep. can kind of help um, develop a program um, so I, I have that back in my office I just I okay. couldn't tell you right now but we try to do a chip seal every um, four or five years we're looking at an overlay um, every 10 years and then the crack seal what we try to do is you're you're looking at you know probably a four to five year um, Time frame is that, but what we try to do is we try to crack seal everything that we're going to chip seal the next year. Gotcha. Okay, so right, so the crack sealing projects that we're doing this year, we're going to chip seal next year. Um, you know, and so that's just a starting point. What we start to, to look at roads, and then you know, so okay, okay, we need to look at these roads, but then we we really evaluate all of our roads. Um, to, to see what what needs crack seal. I mean, that right. crack seal is one of the most important things, in my opinion, that that you can do. You want to seal uh, seal the water out of your base, and that's one of the most effective things. Okay, thank you. Anything yeah. else? Nope, that's it. Okay, can we move up to the 2021 proposed road and bridge program map? All right, thank you. So I'm going to start off with some um, some span bridge projects. You know, these are, are structures that are a little bit bigger um, than what would be needed for a reinforced concrete box. Uh, the first one is a uh, project on Minner Road between Gypsum Valley and Don Meyer Road. Uh, that project's been kind of hanging around for a while, but uh, my goal is to get that project uh, bid out this winter uh, for our 2021 construction. And then the next project, or uh, span project, span bridge project is um, on Waterwell Road, just west, west of Gypsum. And on the map, um, yeah, they're down here. They're kind of probably hard to see see on the, um, the wall there, but it's got a brown rectangle around those locations there. The one, uh, the project on Waterwell Road is we'll just, we'll be designing it in 2021, you know, with a, probably a construction in 2022. Maybe the, the winter of 2022-23 uh, is what we're looking at there. For the reinforced concrete boxes, I actually have two different um, project sets for those. And so there is actually another project set. And if you look on your map, it's the light blue circles. Um, those projects have not been bid yet, but the plans are about 95% done. They're kind of they're sitting on my desk waiting for a final review, and so we'll be um, getting those out for bid here very, very soon. And then um, my staff is working on a, another set of boxes right now, you know, going through the survey and um, design phase. And, and the goal is to, to let those out. And, and 2021 as well. And so that's kind of why I broke broke up our box projects into two different groups there. Um, a, projects, a project that I'm working on right now is a culvert replacement project. Something that we've identified as a, as a need are these um, culvert pipes underneath asphalt roads. You know, Darren showed you some pictures, um, you know, some very poor pipes underneath gravel roads when well, we have those same stru or same pipes underneath our paved roads you know and that's a little more tricky to to replace those uh, and so right now we're looking at we've identified over 70 culverts to where you know that needs needs some attention um, you know here in the next few years and so uh, we, you know we felt like that it's you know it's it's time where we should have a program you know almost every year you know to help start replacing these um, you know, it's something that uh, the maintenance can do, and Darren and I, we, we work together and, and uh, you know, try to find these locations that that engineering can uh, can take on. So, and we've got some complicated projects um, where it's, it's called a broken back pipe. 
uh, where it's just um, a big elevation between the um, upstream elevation and downstream elevation, especially on uh, Brookfield Road. And that's it's not going to be this year, but probably a year after that that they need to be looked at here. Um, and so, but it's it's they're going to be pretty complicated projects for a pipe replacement project. So, so that's something I'm working on right now. Uh, the next project is our uh, the bituminous chip seals. Um, you know, and it's the blue line on your map. Uh, so we've got about 40 miles scheduled, and that's pretty typical um, mileage that we've been doing each year. The um, asphalt overlay is the black lines, and so when we, we've got a couple different roads on here, and, and it's it's going to be a little more unique because what I would like to do. Let me see here. This is um, on up on Old Highway 81 from um, K143 North to the Ottawa Road. Is we I'd like to widen that. I'd like to add a two-foot asphalt um, shoulder onto those roads. You know, Darren mentioned uh, you know earlier. There's a lot of ag equipment that use those shoulders, and it's and it's almost impossible to to keep a. a, a a rock shoulder you know elevated to the to the top of the asphalt and so what I'd like to do is I'd widen that road out um, two foot on each side we'd still probably stripe it where it's at but it gives you that little extra room outside of the, the white lane line uh, to where it's it's we don't have a battle uh, with the shoulder you know and, and that's one of the, the these two roads here the other one is um, old 40 um, you know, down here just west of, or sorry, east of I-135, I um, you know, two of the highest traveled roads, county roads we, we have. Um, you know, we just have some issues holding a rock shoulder, and so let's, let's quit fighting it. Let's add, add a uh, asphalt shoulder and, and, uh, and then overlay those roads at the same time. So those are the two asphalt overlay projects uh, that we have right now. Uh, the next is our, our crack seal. Uh, roads and that is on your um, shown as your red line I do have uh, what I have is you look at your map and there's there's no red lines um, noted on those besides Ohio Street because I, I know uh, right away that Ohio Street is in a pretty poor shape um, as far as the cracks it's got some pretty wide cracks through there we were working on trying to, to quantify uh, how much material that's going to take and so right now we just have Ohio Street on the program right now and it might take all of the the tons of material that, that we can budget for that um, but it's something that that needs to be addressed right away before we start losing that road and then I did on the 2021 um, I, I put these two projects um, and then I'm going to talk about next on the map, even though it's not going to be uh, projects going through the engineering office. It's going to be more maintenance, uh, but it's been part of the, the conversations that we've had with our road upgrade program. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll provide uh, whatever information that, that maintenance needs to do these. And that is the, the one there's in a road upgrade on Thatcher between Ohio and Crystal Springs, and that'll be a, a road upgrade from a earth to a gravel road with county forces. And the other one is Simpson Road between Waterwell and Minner. Um, that's a gravel road right now, but we're going to um, turn that into a, a, a little higher load carrying capacity road uh, with that. So. Um, that's all I have for our projects in our, our 2021. Um, you know, as always, you know, I always pretty make it clear, you know, that's as of, you know, October 16th, uh, you know, when I made this map. You know, things change constantly. Um, you know, that's something that we, we try to be flexible, um, as flexible as we can, you know, about adding and subtracting projects to, to meet the needs uh, that we have out there. So, for, for budget updates, um, the, the total 2020 asphalt construction program, which includes a chip seal, crack seal, the asphalt overlay and the shouldering is estimated to be uh, $2,270,310. And why I say it's estimated is just because we haven't finished some of those projects yet. The available budget for those projects is $2,361,835, and that budget's a combination of the asphalt contractual and shouldering line items, as well as the, uh, the landfill tipping fees and the federal fund exchange program. 
the bridge projects will be taken from the two mil special bridge construction account and it has a current balance of two million two hundred ten thousand eight hundred forty one dollars that seems like it's starting to, to uh, get some significant money sitting there I just want to remind you though that you know we've got a um, three box projects right now you know you're looking at about a uh, little over five hundred thousand dollars for each one of those you know one that's been bid and awarded to Reese construction we got two more um, that are wanting to do this year as well as uh, you know around a six hundred thousand dollar project on on Minna Road um, you know and so we'll be using a lot of these funds um, next next year and then the road improvement projects will be taken from the one mil special road construction account and it has a current balance of $880,545. So are there any questions? All right, questions or comments from commissioners, please. Well, I just want to commend you, the, the whole road and bridge department, everybody on uh, taking care of the uh, culvert that went out on Holmes Road and it was done very within a you know three or four weeks it was done and taken care of and the, and the uh, everybody was very happy that that got done so quickly and very very nice thank you thank you um, I, I'll say that uh, like I said earlier in Darren's uh, presentation we're, we're one rain event away from complaints and problems and so forth but <clears throat> it's been a, a problem free summer for me in terms of uh, uh, fielding complaints uh, during harvest and so forth and, and I'm these are my comments uh, the others can say what they want to say but uh, you guys are doing a great job out there and and uh, every every comment that I've heard from a constituent for I'd say at least 90 days has been a positive comment and and they've even made it a point to say hey the roads are really looking good they're they we're doing a lot of, I'm glad you did this or glad you did that and and uh, so I, I'm you know you, you deserve a pat on the back and we're not a, always able to do that so uh, good job thank you well, it would be remiss for me not to say that I have had a lot of comments on uh, West Waterwell Road uh, the uh, people that live out there are very appreciative of it I hope that they've shared some of that with you or or with Phil but uh, th they are, were quite excited that the project finally did take place after after all those years and I commend you and uh, your efforts to see that project through well I, I did receive a couple thank you cards um, you know and I don't get those very often <laughs> so I, uh, nor do we oh yeah almost never and so yeah I, I keep those those thank you cards underneath my monitors just as a visual reminder you know that there's you know you, you do you know typically you hear a lot of the complaints and the you know the issues out there and it's just it's nice to have that reminder that um, you know there people are appreciative out there as well okay well thank you uh, for your number one for your hard work but thank you for a detailed uh, informational project here also so thanks Darren we'll move to item number four <clears throat> community development block grant applications update committee appointment discussion chairman Vidrickson uh, as you remember last week uh, uh, commissioners uh, we were talking about putting a, a um, committee together to disperse the funds that would go out to the businesses outside of the city of Salina. And with your approval, uh, I have put together that committee and, and, and like, like I said, it's for your approval. And I'll, I'll share that with you now. I have uh, asked uh, Deputy, Commis uh, Deputy uh, Hannah Stambaugh to be our uh, chairman for this committee. I, I've also asked Phil to serve on it uh, simply because of all his knowledge and background and so forth. I have also asked two commissioners, uh, Commissioner Shadwick and Commissioner Weiss, to serve on that committee, along with a citizen at large of Kristen Gunn. So with your approval, uh, if we can get a consensus on that, uh, we'll let them go ahead and get started on that uh, rather quickly and get the funds out to those businesses that are so deserving of it. So comments? Sounds good. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Best of luck with it. Yes. Okay, we'll go Thank forward with that committee and Hannah, uh, Deputy Administrator Hannah, you are in <laughs> charge. You are the boss. And uh, <laughs> like I said, I, I would like you to get that done uh, ASAP. You can get your committee together and, uh, and uh, 
get the funds out to the people that are so deserving. Absolutely. Okay. We'll move to uh, item number five. Commissioner's comments. Anybody have anything? Nope. Nope. Item six. Announcements. Uh, get out and vote if you haven't already. <laughs> and it looks like we have an executive session. Uh, before I do that, uh, before we go into executive session, is there any commissioner who would like to have a break for a couple of minutes? No? I'm good. Okay. We will uh, we'll have an executive session. Um, Ten minutes. Marilyn, I'll let you uh, describe. We'd like an executive session, 10 minutes, non-elected personnel to discuss a performance evaluation. Mr. Chairman, I move we, re we recess into executive session under the non-elected personnel exemption to the Kansas Open Meeting Act for 10 minutes and reconvene in this room at 1039. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we move into executive session. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Both same sign. We are in executive session. All right, I call uh, the meeting of the Board of Commissioners back to order, uh, coming from the executive session. I will say that there was uh, no action taken. And at this time, does anyone have any comments, further comments? If um, not... Uh, yes, Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. We have a birthday guy with us, so we'd like to wish him a happy birthday. He may not publicly want that to be. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Today is uh, the, the birthday of, and a significant one at that, and I won't say which one it is. I'll let him announce that during the paper. But uh, our, our uh, administrator, Philip Smith Haynes, is, his, is a milestone birthday for him. And uh, <laughs> happy birthday to you, Phil. Yeah, happy birthday. This time I would take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded. We adjourn today's meeting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <laughs> We're adjourned. <laughs>